Hi, this is Dan Pastorini, and you're listening to The Grilling Truth. Hey, welcome, everybody, to The Grilling Truth Radio Network. Um, Mike and Aaron Sports World, this is our second edition. Uh, make sure you check out our sponsors, Gridiron Mo and then Steelberg Box. Got to make sure we pay the bills before we start to show off. Um, right now, I'm your host, Mike Goodpastor. I'd like to welcome in my co-host, Aaron Zepnik. How are you doing tonight, Aaron? I'm doing well, Mike. Good to be back. All right, and we got a special guest tonight. He has worked in professional sports with the Evansville Rage. Help me welcome to the grueling truth, Alex Holcomb. How are you guys doing tonight? All right, Alex. We just had Alex on because we've been posting stuff all week on Twitter with polls and everything, and Alex seems like he disagrees with me on everything, so that'd be the way to go. <laughs> That's because I'm right and you're wrong. All right, Alex. Shut up. I got a mute button. All right. <laughs> <laughs> He wants to be Skip Bayless on this show. <laughs> he can be Skip. Yeah, I don't like either one. There's, there's just two bad guys on that one. But we're going to start off with the NCAA Men's Championship. Last week, of course, I wasn't going to bring this up, but I think everybody already knows that I was right on all three games, and Aaron was right on one, which means I'm smarter than Aaron for week one. Aaron, what was your take on me being right and you being wrong? I mean, the games. Well, I was dead wrong in the Oklahoma-Villanova. The The championship game was somewhat what I expected, no matter who played North Carolina. Uh, it was a great game down to the finish, the big shot by Jenkins. Um, I did not see Villanova beating Oklahoma by 40-some points. I don't think anyone did. But I was sitting there watching the game, that game, and I'm thinking to myself at halftime they're down 14, and Villanova shot 67%, and I'm going – there's no freaking way Villanova can come out and shoot that hot in the second half. Oklahoma still got a shot. So I'm sitting there watching the pummeling get worse and worse. They ended up 71% for the game, so I was wrong on that too. I couldn't even be right on a half. So, yeah, you fooled me. You got me, Mike. I didn't fool you. I outsmarted you. Um, oh, you fooled I'll- me. Alex, what was your take right, on it? Kentucky bash in last week. That's what did oh, Be quiet, you hillbilly. <laughs> <laughs> so, Alex, what was your take on the NCAA championship? Oh, I'll be honest with you, um, I didn't be. I wasn't able to catch most of it. I did, did get to watch the end of it, and um, that, that's the problem I always have with with championship basketball. It's it's always decided in the last second. In the last set, in the in the last minute, you never know who's going to win. Uh, I think it's enjoyable to watch, but not my cup of tea. All right, well that's a real downer there. Um, <laughs> the the other poll question we had was the NCAA Women's Basketball Championship, and it, it was basically, I mean, it was over before the tournament even started. It seemed like UConn had every game wrapped up about ten minutes in. Um, so, I what's that your one. opinion? What's your opinion, Aaron? Do you think that it's bad for college, or women's college basketball, or do you think it's good? I think it's history. And, you know, we look back, you referenced it last week, Mike, with the UCLA dominance in the 70s. You know, we look back now, we wouldn't even have that to talk about if it wasn't a dominant thing. And I think Gino Orietta is not getting enough credit for how he recruits and, and what they have going there. He may be the best women's college basketball coach of, of all time. Love him or hate him. But he doesn't have to recruit anymore. That's the problem with it. You know, now every girl that's in middle school who says, I want to go to UConn, it's no longer I want to play college basketball. It's I can't, if I'm great, I'm going to UConn because that's how you win national titles. You know, Baylor every now and again gets a shot at it, and, and they need – they need another team that at least can contest with them. When Pat Summit was coaching Tennessee, more people would watch because you at least had it's Tennessee versus UConn. You know, when the Yankees were great, it was the Yankees versus, you know, the Red Sox. Uh, it's, it's bad for, for being a spectator when you have one team that you go in knowing who's going to win. It's not fun to watch, so people don't watch. Yeah, and Aaron, I hate to say this, but I agree with Alex. It's the first time ever, too. Yeah. Uh, I mean, my my take on it is this. Women's college basketball is not competitive because there's not a lot of great players. It's kind of, it's like like I like I compared it on Facebook and on Twitter to UCLA in the 60s and the early 70s. 
I mean, there's not a ton of talent there. And when all the talent from all around the country goes to the same place, I mean, come on. I, I used to watch the NCAA Women's Championship game when it was Pat Summit against Gino Oriyama. You knew it was going to be a great game. But, I mean, now it's like, why watch it? I mean, I'm, I didn't even remember the game was on Tuesday night. You know, I flipped to the semifinal on Sunday, and, I mean, they're like five minutes in, and it's like 27 to 6. I mean, why do I want to watch that when The Walking Dead's on, Aaron? Nobody wants to watch it, but we at least have to respect the fact that is it is it Geno's fault that he's built that dominance? Is it UConn's fault? No. North Carolina and Duke were both pretty good a few years back when they were both one seeds. And Tennessee, when they had Pat Summit, the Final Four, I still didn't watch it. So I don't think it, it's going to captivate my attention or get me to watch it. But it's still history. It's you know, and and from an athlete's point, Wisconsin and North Dakota and Minnesota are all good in hockey. Well, eventually, Michigan Tech and all these low, Ohio State, Michigan State, Michigan—they're all getting these hockey players because these guys want to be the difference makers. It's it's all a culture of how you're brought up. Alex, your point about nobody talks about wanting to go play college women's college basketball anymore. They talk about going to UConn. Well, it's up to these other coaches. To bring them something, hey, we're one player like you away from catching UConn. You know, it's it's all about recruiting. Yeah, but the problem is, Aaron, they're not one player away from catching UConn. When you lose by 40 or 50 points in a national championship game, that's more than one player. And I think Oriyama, or Oriyama is a great women's college basketball coach because he's a great recruiter. Um, I'd still take Pat Summit over him because Pat Summit. I mean, in the 70s or in the 80s, you had Old Dominion, you had USC, you had Georgia. They were all good competitive teams. The games were good games. They didn't get everybody. And I'm not blaming Oriyama on it. I mean, I'm just saying that if there's not enough talent around the country to fill up other teams, I mean, when is, I mean, the lowest seed I mean, that's ever been to the NCAA Women's Final Four, I think, is the number seven seed. But eventually those girls are going to get sick of sitting on the bench, and they're going to start transferring. You know, only five girls can play. It's the same but, rules for every team. So once these girls transfer and they go to a Baylor or they go to a UK, uh, uh, UNC or a Duke or a Tennessee, eventually it evolves, just like UCLA did, just like the Yankees have. They're in their yeah, yeah but remember this, Aaron. The reason UCLA evolved, a lot of that reason was the fact that John Wooden retired. Yeah, I, I don't think that... UConn, no one's going to catch UConn until Oriama retires. He's too good of a coach. The recruiting that they do, I, those girls aren't transferring. It hasn't happened. How long has he been a coach then, uh, and hasn't, you know, lost girls? Those girls are growing up saying, I want to play for Oriama. You know, it, it's my dad went to a, a, a coach's clinic once where Oriama was uh, coaching or was teaching coaches, and he said, one one big thing is if you don't have the talent, you're not going to win, and no one else has the talent. That's true in every sport. <laughs> you you, you got to have talent to win. Yeah, and I mean, there's just but not A lot of people talent. don't like Ariema, but you have to at least respect what he's doing because, like you said, he doesn't lose girls. Eventually he will. Or eventually when he retires, someone will be the next Gino Ariema, and then that school will – probably be prominent you know for i don't think time. that's going to happen i don't think we're going to see another another coach like oriama that has dominated a sport like he has in my lifetime you know in the next 50 years i don't think we're going to see a coach that has dominated a sport like him who has name any athlete or any coach that is other than wooden that, that has dominated a sport like he has casey stingle no, who, I was the, just gonna say that. who in the world is casey stingle Casey Stengel was a manager of the Yankees when they won, like, 10 World Series over, like, 12 or 13 years. Yeah, it's baseball. No one cares about baseball. No one cares about women's ago. college I mean, basketball. That was a good point there. <laughs> it, it may never happen I mean, come on. I can't time. believe that I'm even talking about this. And I can't believe people are listening to it. Because you know what? When I watch women's college basketball, the game, to me, is the equivalent of men's in about the 40s because you got women going down and missing layups still. <laughs> and that's not to rip it, and I don't want to be a sound like a sexist, but I don't really care because, well, let's face it, I'm the owner of the station. I'll say whatever the hell I want. But, 
<laughs> but the thing is this. I don't want to watch it because it's an inferior product to the men's game. And it's not because they're women. Because, like I said, when it was Tennessee against Old Dominion or Tennessee against USC with Cheryl Miller, I watched that because that was not an inferior product. And by inferior product, I mean, heck, UNLV was rough to watch in 1970 or 1990 when they were beating everybody by 25 points. Yes, yeah, and and if you're that good, like Kentucky's had a few years where they're that good. No, they haven't. As a Kentucky fan, I enjoyed it. When did Kentucky have years where they were as good as UConn? A few years ago, they had a, a gentleman by the name of Anthony Davis, and they were talking about undefeated. I think they won their first 30, 33 games, or they were 33-1 and one at, at one point. But and unfortunately, then, uh, they didn't go undefeated. Last year, they were 38-0 or 39-0 and in Wisconsin. And then they lost. And when you hear somebody say, as a Kentucky fan, you can basically throw out whatever they're saying. Oh, exactly, Alex. I'm glad I had you on this show now. I forgot you didn't like UK. <laughs> Stay on air at night now. <laughs> not, not, every, not everybody can have first-class taste, you know. Hey, the last dominant team in college basketball was probably UNLV. They didn't even go in. The last undefeated was the Indiana Hoosiers. I just figured I'd throw that in there. Bobby I don't think Kentucky's ever had an undefeated team in their history. I believe you're right. All right. Well, I like to end every segment, Alex, with Aaron saying, I believe you're right, so we're going to transition right now Um, (laughs) because it won't last for long. But we're going to transition to another poll we had today on Twitter, which actually got a lot of people checking it out. Um, That poll will actually be up till tomorrow afternoon if you want to get on there and vote. We're at Grueling Truth. Right now it's 59% to 41%. The question was this. As a player like Greg Hardy with a history of domestic abuse, if he is convicted of it, should he be allowed to play in the NFL? Now, this Aaron, you want to start off? Let Alex go first. All right, Alex. Okay. Here is the thing. You have to allow people to make their money. Okay. The NFL is right now the only area – where you can make a decent wage as a football player. You have the CFL, but they don't even break over $100,000 in their uh, salary. I don't agree with the NFL permanently banning a player for really almost anything other than, uh, you know, egregious like murder, rape, you know, and if he is a, you know, a domestic violence person who has gone over three convictions, then yes, you can ban the player. But I think that it should be left up to the teams. If the teams want to take on that heat from the news cycle, from fans, from everything, I think that they should be allowed to. I think that once the fans have spoken, he will be effectively banned, like Johnny Manziel. I don't think he'll ever play a game again, not because he's a bad person, but because he's not worth it to the teams. I think that they should be allowed to have that opportunity to play. Yeah, but shouldn't that not be worth it to the league to have guys like that playing? And, see, you say that there's no other place where you – if you're a lawyer, I'm on here. I just put in disbarred for domestic abuse. There's thousands of pages of lawyers that were disbarred because they were convicted of domestic abuse, and I don't think those lawyers are going to get another lawyer in job anywhere else in this country once they're disbarred. But being a disbarred lawyer, you can still get a job in in that field. They could work as a consultant, or they could work in business, or something like that. It, Look at NFL players. They can work in, in, the, in, the, in the office. They could be an assistant coach. They could do other things. Do you think that the player, fans are – if you're banned from the NFL, you can't work in the NFL, whether you're a player or not. It's just well, like Pete Rose. Football, there's, other, there's other areas in that field that they can go get a job at. My point is – how can you put a a price or a, a penalty that's two or four games on something, and then if a guy shoots himself in the leg, you know, the same sort of penalty comes down, or if they smoke marijuana or use performance-enhancing drugs, all of that can't carry the same weight. There's much – in domestic violence, you're hurting an inferior person that's not as strong as you, and – and smoking marijuana, you're not hurting anyone but yourself unless you have your kids in the room or something. But if you're 
causing bodily harm on another individual off the field, that is illegal. And if you do something to that nature and you're hurting people because you're a strong NFL player, you automatically put yourself in a higher standard because that's a black eye for the league. If they don't take a firm stance on that, then they're going to always look back and go, well, Ray Rice got this, Greg Hardy got this. You know, Jamie Lofton, guys from the Packers back in the 80s had it happen. You have to have a firm stance on this or you give yourself no credibility. Yeah, but there's your problem, and I think that's what Alex is talking about. With the NFL, they're a league that punishes off perception. You know, if Ray Rice would still be playing if there was no video. I mean, the NFL has been proven. Roger Goodell tried to cover it up as bad as he could. Now, this is my thing. A guy like Ray Rice is still with his wife. He's went through counseling. He's done, I mean, he volunteers at his local school to talk to kids. He's actually trying to do the right thing now. And my thing is this. I, I think a lot of times this country in itself is bigger on just punishing people than it is trying to help people get better from whatever their problem is. So I don't necessarily think, I, from what I saw with Ray Rice, I don't think he should play again because he hit his wife. He should be reforming. And, I mean, he's still got a college degree. He can still make money. It's not like it's the only thing these guys can do. And if it is, I mean, that's another strike against society and the way these guys are treated from the time they're eight years old and look like they can play a sport better than most people. So, I mean, when you look at it, I, the weed thing, I mean, hell, if you're a Denver Bronco, how can you get in trouble for weed? It's legal in your state. And the other thing okay. is you don't hurt anybody but yourself with the weed. You don't hurt but, anybody but yourself with the drugs. But when you're hitting a woman, that's a problem. Yeah. Well, the NFL's drug policy is is just dumb. They they don't understand drugs at all. There's players in, in uh, that have gotten in trouble for taking Adderall after it's a has a doctor's prescription for it. The but the whole thing with the marijuana with the Denver Broncos, your employer can still say you cannot you know, work high, you know, uh, you can't do this or you can't do that. It's just like the Yankees and the no beard thing. Uh, I'm okay with them saying no marijuana. All right, but you you're can't... not all right with them saying no domestic abuse? No, no, that's not what I'm saying. If well, you that's listen. what you just said. No, I didn't. I said that they can punish for it. I never said that they should be allowed to ban for it. I don't oh. think the NFL should be in the business of banning people. They are an oversight. They are owned by the the teams. They should. It's Let me like, ask you this, Alex. They, Let me ask you this. Okay. We just talked about college, women's college basketball. How you said, as a fan, you don't want to watch something like that. Barry Bonds with the with the performance enhancing rumors with him, or whatever they are. There's an asterisk. I don't care what the record books show. Hank Aaron will still be the home run king, in my opinion, until not only because I'm named after him, but until it's proven that Barry Bonds never took anything. What's that? Your name's Hank? No, Aaron after Hank Aaron. I know. I'm just but anyway, if you are a fan or any voter for the Hall of Fame or whatever, if Greg Hardy's on your ballot, are you voting for him? with that domestic abuse thing, as a fan, are you wanting to watch a guy like that? I can tell you, after reading what was on the domestic abuse report from this gal, the fact that he threw her on, allegedly, threw her on a couch full of armed, you know, uh, firearms and bragged about how they were all loaded and stuff, do you think that's a safe individual to be able to make millions of dollars? Do you think that's a person that you want your kids watching as a role model? Do you want... Oh, so see, that's the problem. And watch that guy play on your team. NFL players aren't role models. They may be posted up and they may have things, but I will teach my kids that you should never look to a to anybody that you don't know personally as a role model. All right, okay? your problem with that, Alex, is this. I agree with you. They shouldn't be role models. But there are a lot of kids that don't have fathers in the home, whether they're black or white anymore. It seems to be a prevalent thing where 52% of people are divorced. So, and you don't always have. So then oversight. their parents, then then their parents need to show them good role models. You know, yeah, they, they should be that, educating you know what, them. Though? Wouldn't it, it be great? Wouldn't it be great if you could point to the TV and say that's a great role model? You can't. You cannot show me a good role model 
Because of one thing, the only person that can be a role model to their son or to their kids is their father or their mother because they're the only ones that know what's in their heart. You know, nobody knows what's in anybody's heart. Who are you going to have a role model, Donald Trump, Barack Obama? I mean, you don't know what's in a person's heart to be able to idolize anybody. No. So, I mean, really, you shouldn't idolize anybody. But I think Aaron's point is this. He doesn't want to sit around and watch a football game with his son, and when they bring up Greg Hardy and they start showing him and they start talking about what he did, you don't exactly. want to have to answer those questions from your son. And, and the then, other thing – the Then I teach my son. Hey, but then I teach my son that he's a if bad you, person. I if, don't buy Greg Hardy jerseys. Then I tell – thing. Greg Hardy, since they kept him in the NFL – you know, assaulted a coach last year, shoved a coach, got in a fight with one of his teammates. And when you keep people that have no moral character at all on a team, they will wreck that team. And that's what then that team. Then that team should cut him. Or better yet, instead of cutting them, put him on a non-active roster and make him sit out a ga- games and let him not play. That's what I would do. That's what I would expect my team to do. I don't expect the NFL to ban him. I expect every team to have the moral fiber to say, yes, you are available, but no, we are not taking you because you are a bad person, because you're a domestic abuser. That's, that's how I want it to happen. I don't the want NFL, the NFL to have to ban him. But the NFL is supposed to oversee their league. And if you have guys with low moral character in your league, they represent you poorly. I mean, they always do. These guys very rarely change. I mean, come on. It's, they very rarely change. It's not like he smoked weed, which, I mean, shouldn't be illegal. And if you want to get to it, the Adderall, that's a drug as strong as anything. You know, it's not like weed. There's a lot of players in the NFL that I know that smoke pot for the pain because they don't want to take biking in because there's a chance you can get addicted to it. And I am all for that. I am for marijuana legalization, and I think that it is a great pain reliever. But I, I'm agreeing with you that they shouldn't be in the league, but I think it would be a stronger and more permanent message to say, yes, you are available to us, and yes, you are a top five defensive lineman, but your character issues outweigh that, and we don't want to mess with you. Yeah, but the I problem, think when you're – go ahead. Okay, so here's the issue. You have, a, you have Greg Hardy on your team who is a domestic abuser, and then you have, say, a special teams player who maybe plays two plays in the game, and he's a domestic abuser. Jerry Jones and all those guys are willing to cover up for Greg Hardy, but that other guy, he gets kicked off the team because he's not worth the news yeah, cycle. See, that's my point. My point is yeah. this. The NFL does not regulate everything the same. They do have to be the ones to dole out the punishments because you can't, you can't expect teams to punish their players and everybody be equal. But and I agree with that. Guys, and, and, and you've got a guy. You just said it. I mean, they will cut one guy for doing it and another guy for not. That is why you cannot leave it up to an individual team. That is why the league oversees all these individual teams that all have a vote on everything, but no one team has the right to really dictate to the entire NFL what goes on. But the entire NFL can say, hey, you can't get rid of this guy if he did the same thing this guy did. And if you right have it where they say, you know, you're banned for domestic abuse, then everybody is, and it's a fair playing field. And if you go back in and signing your contract, that's the big thing. You sign a contract knowing what the rules are of the league. If you sign a contract saying, I will abide by these bylaws, and then you don't, you don't deserve a job. If I yeah. go to work and I tell my boss, yeah, I'm not going to use my cell phone at work, or I'm not going to watch porn on my computer at work, and then I do it, I don't deserve a job in that field. Okay, for that example. Say you're on your computer and you're looking at porn, okay, and it's and it's straight porn. But your boss well, goes, hey, you, hold on, yeah, I know. Hey, knock that off. You can't do that. Now, uh, Joe, your next door neighbor is looking at it's porn, but it's a little dominatrix porn, okay. And your boss goes, oh no, you're fired. That's what's happening in the NFL. They're perceiving what the public doesn't like. And they're saying, you get eight games, you get six games, and they're doing this before their conviction. That's see, the biggest again, problem. Alex, if there is a blanket rule that if you do this, this is the penalty, that doesn't happen. 
That's my whole yeah. point to this whole thing. If it's a blanket rule, the NFL says, well, if you get caught snorting cocaine, it's four games. If you got caught beating the hell out of your wife, we don't want you back. Everybody knows that, and that it may not stop it because there's a lot of sick individuals that do things that are not right, and they know that's not right when they're doing it. No, but, definitely. They, those are horrible you might people. Have, you might have some guys that think twice if they are playing and they see a Greg Hardy who's one of the best defensive players in the NFL, and all of a sudden he did this thing and he's not allowed to play anymore because I think the Ray Rice thing set a good precedent for players to hear but then it is completely wiped out when Greg Hardy, who from reading it might have done a lot worse stuff than Ray Rice, and then has, players, has proceeded to been terrible for the next year with the Cowboys. Players and learned I, with Ray Rice not to get videotaped. I, I have a side view take on this. I agree with both of you in a sense, but Mike, I agree with the blanket penalty, but I don't think banned for life is necessarily – because you want to give people a chance to change. But what it has to be is the same for every player in a uniform. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Because if you remember yeah. at the start, I said that I think the biggest the problem. The first time it happens again, then you're done. Yeah. Yeah. If you remember at the start, I started off by saying that I thought the biggest problem with this country is they're more for punishing people than they are reforming people. Yeah, so yeah. I'm not necessarily yeah. saying you should be. Yeah, and I'm that's just what more, yeah, if I'm just you going off what the question was. Where you should be bannered. And if everybody had the same rule to play by, because I think there's very little that should get a guy banned from the NFL, because I'm more for let's reform a guy and try to help him out more than, hey, he made a mistake and let's just throw him overboard. Yeah. I am for a uh, four game ban, your first offense, a year ban, your second offense, and if you do it a third time, you're gone. You're done, banned for life. That would be fine by me. I, I, I don't yeah, agree with that. that. Because if we're doing a reform thing, you cannot reform somebody to just beat the hell out of a woman in four weeks. I think what it should be. Exactly. I think it should Not be that, that three year ban. You out of her job for more than four weeks yeah. because you beat the If you're out of the out. NFL for three years, your career is yeah. done. Well, that's fine. But you know what? Michael Vicks just... wasn't. He was that gone for a year, not three. Years. I'm asking for at least eight games or until they've completed an anger management and domestic abuse counseling session to show their reformity, to show that they've gotten over what they were doing and they understand the consequences and they understand what was wrong. It doesn't have to be a lengthy thing, but that girl might be out of work for more than four weeks. She, she might be dead. You know, the yeah. second time, she might be dead, Alex. You get well, then he's days. a murderer and he can't go to go to the NFL because he's in jail. Then then he's in jail. It wouldn't be an issue then. But I agree with uh, Aaron that That's there needs up. to be no. anger management issues. Or there needs to be ang- counseling. But instead of for eight weeks, they need it for the entire time they're in the NFL. These players are taught but to see, be this violent. But the problem, Alex. These players are taught like that. And the problem with the NFL is they only care about their players when they're playing. And you just said something that for the rest of their career they should be like that. I think that should be offered for the rest of their life. Okay. Yeah. I, I would I would be totally fine with that. And you're right. But there are bit you, you can't forget that the NFL is a business. They in the and the players are their products. And until there is public outrage, they will do it for as cheaply as they can. Look at the concussion issue. They tried to hide the concussion issue because it was cheaper for them for there to be no concussion issue whatsoever. The NFL is going to do everything as cheaply as humanly possible. And until there's public outrage. They're a big corporation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And until there's a public outcry, there's not going to be any fix. I agree. But, uh, you know. I think Aaron's agreed with me more than you, by the way, Mike. I would say you also know me, and I could really care less I'm, if anybody agrees with me or not. <laughs> Here's the thing, Alex, about the about the jersey thing. I just want to touch on this. You go to any NFL practice uh, in training camp, you go to any NFL game. Heck, you go to IFL games. You go to any game you want to, and you'll see kids wearing an NFL player's jersey that they look up to. You can't tell a kid you can't like this player because he broke a rule. Well, number one, the best parent.
parenting, in my opinion, is to not expose them to it if you can. And I'm not going to sit and tell my son, well, Marshawn Lynch actually, you know, you shouldn't like him because of this, this, and, you know, less is more. I don't have to tell my son, well, Marshawn Lynch isn't good with the media. You know, I shouldn't have to explain that stuff. Well, you know what you tell your son? This is what my dad told me when I was younger, which was many, many years ago. It was around 1930s? The time, it's around the time Kevin Cosner and Dances with Wolves, I think like 1860 or something. But what Casey he always Stengel, told me was this. Casey Stengel is the manager of the Yankees. <laughs> for, for my birthday, 1977, my Uncle Perry Wright owned a sports good, or sporting goods store did screen sprinting. I was a Bengals fan, but they never made the playoffs, so I cheered for the Vikings during the playoffs. And I told my dad for my birthday, or for Christmas it was, for, for Christmas, I want a Fran Tarkington jersey. So, Christmas morning, I open it up. There's a number 10 Viking Fran Tarkington jersey. I turn it around, and you know what's on the back of it? What's that? On the back of it is my name. And my dad said, why would any girl, why would any man want to wear another man's name on their back? It's a good, that's a good, I like your dad. He's old school. My dad that's that's of, fair but enough. But my point, my point getting back to that was, until every father or, or every parent couple in the world stops buying them players' jerseys, it's a money-making thing for the NFL, and they will continue to skate around it the best they can to keep making money. Yeah. So, and why should they stop then? So why should they stop? They won't. So, it, so, it is a parent issue. And, I'm, I, and I do not have any kids, but how I was brought up, explanations are better for kids, and I'm not talking about three- and four-year-olds. I'm talking about ten and up, that I would be more comfortable with telling my niece, because I have a niece, that, no, you can't wear an Adrian Peterson jersey. He beat the hell out of his kid, and I don't want, I don't want to support that. And then I would explain why it's bad and why it's not okay. And I understand that everybody has their own parenting, and, and I, and yeah, I support see, Alex, that. The thing you've got to understand is this. When we grew up, it was like that. With society today, people are bombarded at school with all the crap these teachers you know, teach the kids what they hear at school, what they hear on the radio coming home on the bus. You know, if you leave them unattended for 10 minutes, it's hard to tell them what they're going to watch on the TV. I mean, society as a whole has been completely dumbed down. And, I mean, it's basically, it's like a cat. When you put a light out in front of it, it'll chase it all over the place and not even think about what's going on. doesn't even dawn on them that it's wrong because, you know, every other cat does that. <laughs> so what's wrong with educating the, the children then? What's wrong with parents the taking... Problem, the, the problem is this. Anymore, the way this society is, they take as much control away from parents as they can. They teach kids stuff at school that they don't need to learn. You know, my kid needs to learn how to balance a checkbook. You know? That'd be nice. You know, teach a kid that, you know, if you got a credit card, if you don't pay, I mean, if you're buying this car and it costs 15000 you put it on a credit card, it's going to take you 20 years to pay it off. That's what you teach my kid at school. You know, you keep your opinion on society out of it. And, I mean, I'm not a right-winger or a left-winger. I hate both wings. I'm a libertarian. So, <laughs> I mean, I have no use for it. I think the states should control the schools, you know, which, I mean, the biggest problem with this country is the federal government runs everything, and they run it right into the ground because they're just like the NFL. They're only worried about lining in their pockets, and they don't care who they hurt to do it. That, that's, that's a whole other topic, Mike. And I, 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 and I ain't got that up. kind of time. We're going to get into a conversation on politics here. And, um, the only thing I'll add to that with the school thing is I agree. Stop changing every 10 years how you teach math. Stop changing everything. Everybody nowadays, oh, you, your kid punches somebody at school, you're going to get sued. Like, that's my biggest worry is, you know, is my kid going to go to school and get pissed off one day and jack some Johnny in the mouth. Well, Next thing you know, I, I, I can tell you off. my problem with the schools is this. My youngest one's now homeschooled because he had a kid jump him in the bathroom at Greendale Middle School in Lawrenceburg, Indiana. I know some people will be listening. He got hit about 10 to 15 times from the back. He turned around, and he cracked the kid back once. 
They tried to suspend my kid for four days. I took him out and I homeschooled him. My older one went to Lawrenceburg High School. They call me one day and they tell me that they want to drug test my son. And I told them no. They don't. I, I immediately asked them what was the reason, what was their probable cause to do that. And they told me it's because it's what we do, it's random. And yeah, I said, well, I'm not just... teaching my kid to give up his Fourth and Fifth Amendment rights because you want to randomly test him. I said, if you don't have a reason to test him, you don't test him. I, That's which the, schools that he was in. Yeah, the, the Southern Dearborn uh, Conference or whatever you want to call them, they get around that by – because I went to East Central High School. And if you drive to school – you have to sign a contract that says you agree to random drug tests. Yeah, so you basically sign away your Fourth and Fifth Amendment rights. Yeah, and I agree that that's not right. I totally, I don't think schools should be allowed to randomly drug test. That's that's not what they're there for. They're there for education, not for policing. Yeah. But I agree totally. yeah, it, that, that's all I really have about that. I, I I try not to. I could be here two hours talking about how bad our schools are right now. All right, real quick, we only got a couple minutes because Alex, I think, is calling in from work, and we don't want to get him fired. But the other poll we had was the Golden State Warriors now won 70 games. A lot of people say they should rest their players the way the San Antonio Spurs are. Um, Aaron, do you think they should rest the players or go for the record? I think that Kerr is is handling this absolutely brilliantly. I think that he should let the team decide. They had a meeting, from what I understand, uh, and the players are deciding, and the way it sounds with Draymond Green and Curry and some of these other guys, they absolutely want to go for history. And history, my, you talked about how your dad told you not to put a guy's name on your back. My dad taught me history is this. You're either part of it or you're making it. Let these young men make history or at least have a shot to. Resting you... They can rest in the second half of all the first-round games against whoever the eighth seed is because they're not going to be close. So they'll get plenty of rest in that first round. Go for it. I say go ahead and do it. As much as I love Scotty and MJ from, you know, when they did, went to 72-10, and 10, I say go for the record. All right. Alex? Uh, I think that they should definitely go for the record. Um, I mean, like he said, I'd rather make history – then uh, then watch it go by, and I, I don't agree with resting players. I you you don't break up their their habits. You just keep them on the same habit. You keep them on the same go. And if somebody gets injured, well, that's just the way basketball goes sometimes. Well, look at it. The difference between the Indianapolis Colts and the New England Patriots. The Patriots would continually play their seasons out. The Colts would sit Manning for a game or two at the end and. I mean, the Patriots were better with a better coach. but And still, this thing about the greatest team, it would be the greatest record ever. The greatest basketball teams that ever lived were the 86 Celtics and the 87 Lakers. But Alex, any final words? I know you got to go. Uh, no, man, I just really appreciate the opportunity to uh, sit there and chat with you guys. All right. Thanks well, for coming I want to make this a normal thing if you can get lunch at the same time every night. <laughs> That'd be nice, right? <laughs> so, all right. Well, I want to thank Alex Holcomb for coming in. Um, Aaron, you got any final words? Yeah, just, uh, with the with the Golden State thing, if these guys are 36, you know, like Grandpa Duncan, yeah, I'd say then maybe we rest a guy or two. But these guys are 23, 26, 28 years old. Like Curry's the veteran, you know. So that's that's the big thing. I mean, if they're older and you needed a rest, then I see it. But um. I think this was a great show, uh, great Alex having another uh, opinion. And uh, as always, Mike, thanks a lot for having me, and uh, this was very enjoyable. Yeah, and it was surprising because I've never known Alex to have an opinion. No kidding, right? See? And I even was going to let him go so he could go back to work, but he listened in just in case there was one more argument he could get in. <laughs> <laughs> but, hey, I want to thank Alex for coming in, and Aaron, as always. Uh, make sure you check out thegrillingtruth.net. Our players that were interviewed this week were Luis Sharp, Mike Bass, both great players, pro bowlers. Make sure you check those out. Um, we've got a Bradley Pacquiao pay-per-view, pay-per-view preview with our boxing show that we did last night. Make sure you look, check that out. Um, we missing anything here, Aaron? Oh, check out at Grilling Truth on Twitter. And then check us out on Stitcher, Spreaker, and iTunes. So anything else, Aaron? Did I miss anything? 
No, I think you got it all. You're right, Mike. All right. That's, uh, we can't leave the show until he says you're right, Mike. So also make sure you check out The Real Deal with Josh Benjamin. Very good show. Um, former head football coach at North Decatur High School over here in Indiana. He did a show recently, or last night actually, about youth sports and what parents, players, coaches can do to make them better, um, some of the bad things that go on, and then some of the good things and things they think that can be changed. So make sure you check out The Real Deal with Josh Benjamin. That will be on every Friday night. So for Alex Holcomb, Aaron Zepnick, I'm Mike Goodpastor. You've been listening to The Grueling Truth, where the legends speak.